well afterwards. Um, so welcome everybody again. We're really excited to have you here and I want to turn things over now to Mary French, our presenter for today. Okay, can you hear me? Let's see, I'm um, just opening up the screen share and there we go. So thank you so much for attending this talk, even, you know, virtually. It's so great that I can do this um, because, you know, it's a project. This is a, I'm going to be talking mostly about a project that I worked on last summer that was really exciting for me. It was a Victorian scrapbook filled with lots of human hair, which was very unusual. I can't say I've ever encountered something like that in my career as a book conservator before. Um, so I'm excited to share it with you all today. And I just want to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Mary French. I'm an associate book conservator at the Northeast Document Conservation Center, which is located in Andover, Massachusetts. And we're a nonprofit. It was originally set up by the six New England state governments back in the 1970s to do conservation work, mainly for the state libraries and government organizations of their, you know, archives and sort of state documents. And it's over time morphed into a regional conservation center where we work on books and books, books, manuscripts, manuscripts, video preservation department. Um, we also have a digitization team and then a preservation team which travels to museums and libraries all over the US um, to do collections assessments. Um, and with that, I will jump right in. So in 2019, the Davenport House Museum in Savannah, Georgia, brought a 19th century album to the Northeast Document Conservation Center for assessment, conservation, and digitization. The Sarah Davenport scrapbook contained an unusual surprise. Locks of human hair that Sarah Davenport had collected from her family and tied into the book using silk ribbons. Due to the presence of this hair, which was slightly brittle and often detached from the support leaves, as you can see right here. And there was also the need to pre uh, preserve the artifactual value of the volume. This project required drawing upon elements of textile, objects, and book conservation to find a workable solution. Victorian hair albums are rarer than the relatively more well-known hair work, such as wreaths and jewelry. They're also a culturally different phenomenon. Hair wreaths and hair jewelry were often created as acts of mourning. The jewelry served as a way to keep a loved one near you as you went on with your daily life. And it was also a socially acceptable fashion accessory during the official mourning period where you might otherwise expect to be wearing very plain clothing. Um, so the jewelry was a style icon as well, but considered acceptable for this mourning time period. Hair wreaths, like the one seen here, um, were also common and used as an act of mourning, although they might include hair from various family members. Uh, this one isn't in the characteristic horseshoe shape, but often these wreaths were in sort of a reverse horseshoe, and that was uh, meant to signify an ascent into heaven because the end was open towards the sky. Hair albums, on the other hand, were often created from locks of hair from living friends and family, and it more closely relates to the concept of an album amicorum or a friendship album. Friends exchanged locks of hair as a token of affection or sometimes remembrance if a friend was moving far away and it was unlikely that they would ever see each other again. Locks of hair ranged from simple bunches as were the case for this particular scrapbook that I'm talking about. Um, but they could also be elaborate braided and looped creations, which you can see in this photograph on the slide here. Although it seems odd and a little bit grim to us in the modern day, in the days prior to photography, hair represented a tangible way to remember someone, and it was a form of physical representation. The Davenport House Museum, located in Savannah, Georgia, was built by local master builder Isaiah Davenport in the early 19th century as a home for himself, his wife Sarah, and their 10 children. In 1955, just hours before the historic house was scheduled to be demolished 
to pave way for a parking lot, it was purchased by the newly formed Historic Savannah Foundation. Over the next seven years, the house was restored and was opened to the public as a historic house museum in the early 1960s. Sarah Davenport was gifted this album in 1829 by an unnamed friend. Although many hair albums were friendship albums, Sarah's book has more focus on mourning than is usual, and perhaps this is because it was given to her in the same year that her mother died. Oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, the album contains locks of hair from family members, including Sarah's husband, three of her children, her maternal grandmother, mother, and father who predeceased the creation of the album, in some cases by decades. So it's clear that Sarah had been collecting hair long before she ever thought to assemble it in one place. She also put locks of hair from the remainder of her children, their spouses, and her grandchildren in the album, arranging it by birth order and family unit into a family tree of sorts. The album also contains handwritten poems and anecdotes on memory, youth, beauty, love, mortality, and faith. But it deviates from a traditional friendship album in that there are no keepsakes or signatures from friends and family. The hair album was given a thorough assessment prior to forming a treatment plan. The volume consisted of a full leather binding with blind and gold tooling on the boards and spine. There were several structural issues with the binding, which included a detached front board and broken sewing in the first two sections of the book, which caused them to break free of the remainder of the text block. The cause of this damage was text block distortion caused by the addition of thick locks of hair, as you can see here, which were located through the first three sections and this type of damage is very characteristic of scrapbooks created from books that were never meant to accommodate the addition of extra materials by the reader. The text block of this album does not have any compensation stubs to account for the bulk of the hair, and so this strained sewing and board attachments to the point of breaking over time. The remainder of the text block and the back board attachment did not break, but this is because no additional materials were added to the volume before, beyond the first three sections. The text block consisted of sections of machine-made paper sewn through the fold onto two recessed cords. There were manuscript entries throughout the text block and locks of hair were tied with silk ribbons to the text block through slits in the support leaves, which you can see here. The silk ribbons were brittle and fractured, and as a result, many of the locks of hair were detached from the text block. Historic hair tends to get more brittle as it ages, and these 200-year-old locks were no exception. Some were broken at their attachment point where the thread or ribbon tied around the hair had created a single compression point, like so, which bore the brunt of the mechanical strain, and over time, snapped. Several support leaves were torn or had losses at the attachment slits, again a result of the hair straining at a single point. Some hair locks had even separated over time, as seen here. I discovered during examination that some support leaves contained a white colored powder. Given the Victorian's fondness, for treating natural history specimens with arsenic, mercury, and lead, I didn't want to take the risk of unknowingly exposing myself to a hazardous material. The powder served no artifactual purpose. It wasn't important to the structure of the book or its history because it was located only on blank support leaves between leaves that actually contained the hair locks. So I chose to remove the powder using a HEPA filtered vacuum in our chemical fume hood. This reduced the risk of cross-contamination from the volume, but it did not eliminate it. So I continued to wear PPP, or PPE through the remainder of the treatment process. It was lucky that I did this treatment project last year when N95 masks and nitrile gloves were plentiful. After a thorough surface cleaning, 
I lifted leather on the boards and spine to facilitate the eventual reback and also improve access to the spine for cleaning. The spine was cleaned with a 4% meth methyl cellulose gel poultice. And this gel is just made from a cellulose derivative. It's actually so safe and so stable. It's in a lot of commercially produced food products, um, which is one of the reasons that we use it. And it helps deliver moisture to say adhesive on the spine of the book without getting the object too wet. Because the backboard and the spine leather were still attached, I masked those areas off with Melanex, um, which is previously um, you know, a different form of mylar, to avoid damaging the leather. And then once the spine was cleaned, I removed the first two sections, which were already loose and almost entirely detached. I guarded the spine folds, meaning that I attached them together with Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste. And I also used these materials to mend the tears and the support leaves and filled losses in the previous points of attachment, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner. The stabilization of the hair locks was the most difficult part of the conservation process. I needed to decide whether it was safe to remount the hair and also whether doing so was appropriate for the album and the client's needs. The album had a significant amount of artifactual value stemming from Sarah's careful arrangements of the hair, and it would lose most of its meaning if the hair locks were removed and stored separately. Many of the hair locks had already gone missing over time, and reattachment would help prevent further loss. The hair was slightly brittle, but not alarmingly so, and so it could be handled safely provided I was careful. This meant that the hair could be remounted, However, the hair wasn't strong enough to simply reattach them by tying ribbons through the slits in the paper. And many of the uh, support leaves of the text block had torn because of this original attachment method anyway. I conducted a thorough literature search of all available publications um, on Victorian hair work and you know, natural history specimens and so on. But there wasn't really a direct precedent for the type of project I was about to do. So I decided to talk to two textile conservators, also located in Andover, Massachusetts, Camille Myers Breeze and Morgan Fly Carbone of Museum Textile Services, about how they stabilize fragile textiles. I learned that they stitch the original materials between a backing layer of a polyester woven textile and an upper layer of nylon thermoset net using an ultrafine polyester thread. I also read several articles on historic wigs and wig conservation and felt that there was a strong historical precedent for securing hair by attaching it to te textiles. Before attempting this method with the historic locks of hair, I experimented with the technique to ensure that it worked and that it was safe for the hair. I couldn't get a hold of real human hair short of cutting my own, which I wasn't ready to do. So I decided to use what's known as hair silk, which looks and feels very similar, but is actually a very fine silk thread. During text testing, I discovered that the thermoset net was visually distracting when laid on top of the hair. I also discovered that the fine woven polyester backing layer was very prone to fraying and that I'd have to heat seal the edges after sewing. I was reluctant to get a heated tool too close to the historic hair. The thermoset net, on the other hand, did not fray when trimmed, making it an ideal backing layer. Now the nylon thermoset net that I chose is used by textile conservators, but it can also be a controversial choice of textile because there is evidence that it degrades when exposed to light. However, in this case, the netting would be covered by hair in the closed pages of the book, which would then be stored in a custom drop spine cloth covered box. Light exposure to the volume long term would be minimal, so it was decided to proceed with the nylon textile since it offered the most support while minimizing visual impact. There were two identical locks of detached brown hair on this page. 
One was tied with a pinkish beige silk ribbon and one larger curl of hair. When examining the support leaf where two locks of hair were located, it was discovered that one name had had hair attached in two places underneath the name, which was unusual for the volume. The left-hand attachment slot had an unbroken knot of brown thread on it. It was thought that the hair broke at this second attachment point, leaving the curl attached and also unbound by thread. The right-hand attachment slit had a loss in the paper, which explains why the silk ribbon was still attached on the other lock of hair. It was decided that these two locks of hair should be stitched onto one piece of textile since there was strong evidence that they belonged together. The netting needed to be held at an even tension so that the hair wouldn't pucker after stitching but lie flat. An embroidery hoop would have stretched the hair too much, causing uneven tension when released. Instead, I used a window mat cut out of black mat board. A small square of net was attached to the mat board using painter's tape. The tape held the textile flat with minimal tension so that it would not contract when released. The painter's tape could be removed relatively easily so that both mat and tape could be reused, minimizing waste materials. The thermoset net and Gutermann Scala polyester thread recommended by Camille and Morgan, the textile conservators, came in a variety of colors and both net and thread were selected to match each lock of hair. Once the netting was attached, I, I flipped the board over so that the hair could nestle inside the recess of the window mat. I tied a simple square knot around one thread of the nylon net using the polyester thread. The thread had a tendency to slide out of the eye of the needle, so I tied a square knot with this end too. The knot was able to be undone by picking it gently with an awl. As I mentioned before, the polyester thread color was chosen based on hair type. Most of the locks were a pretty good match to the dark brown, medium brown, or light yellow thread. The thread was fine enough that it closely resembled the hair itself. Once the hair was in place, I took some extra time to arrange it, mostly making sure that the curl of the lock fell in the most natural position and that any strands of hair sticking out of the lock were tucked back into it so that it would be included in the stitching process. I wanted to avoid compression points where hair could possibly break over time, so I kept the tension of the thread loose and also made the stitches large enough to spread any strain out over a larger surface area. The technique that worked best was to thread the stitch through several layers of hair at varying depths. This method held the hair in place while leaving very little of the stitch visible. Once sewing was complete, the thread was tied to the tail of the thread from the initial knot and both were threaded through the nylon net before trimming the ends. The net was then trimmed as closely as possible to the hair. The hair was held gently by a micro spatula or flat edge tweezers to keep it away from the scalpel blade. The inner circle of the hair lock was trimmed first, followed by the outer edge to maintain net tension and avoid hair movement. Once the excess net had been trimmed away, the lock of hair was ready to be remounted. As you can see from this photograph, the net and thread are almost invisible when viewed top down so the treatment successfully served to stabilize the hair while minimizing visual change caused by treatment. When looking at the back of the lock of the hair, you can see that the textile and thread were quite a bit more distracting. And this is one of the reasons why I chose not to sort of sandwich the hair between two layers of textile. Luckily, in the book, the hair is not going to be viewed from both so once I stabilized all of the hair, I determined that the lock's original locations um, were not necessarily 
where the hair had ended up in the book. Some of the hair had shifted around from page to page. And, you know, I had to do a little bit of detective work to locate where the hair should be. So fortunately, in the case of these loose locks of hair on this particular page, um, the hair had stained the text block underneath it. And so I um, was able to orient the hair based on that staining pattern. Oops, there we go. Um, I also used UV imaging to determine the original lock locations when the discoloration wasn't as immediately obvious. Um, so I used basically a simple UV light and you can see here that exposes a lot more of the staining on the support leaves. Um, and this really helped me discover where the remainder of the hair had been. Um, so the UV light showed that there actually were a lot more locks of hair that should have been in the book um, because there was this staining on the support leaves. And this showed me that a lot of the hair had gone missing over time. I used little slips of Japanese tissue um, made out of kozo fiber from a mulberry tree to reattach the support or the hair to the support leaves. And I attached this paper to the hair by actually stitching it to the net with a little additional strip of nylon net over the top and used a couple of stitches in the paper itself to secure it. Once stitched, the edges of the paper slip were woven into the already existing slits in the paper around the support leaves. This particular lock on the slide was positioned based on the orientation of the text in and around it. The paper slips were adhered with wheat starch paste above and below the slit in the support leaf to avoid straining the fragile slit. While all of the large locks of hair were able to be reattached to the support leaves, a number of loose hair knots, strands, and stubs were not because it was unclear which fragments had come from which lock. And these were reserved separately and returned to the client. The silk ribbons I stabilized where possible using something that's called a solvent set tissue made with silk crepeline, which I then um, added a little bit of diluted adhesive to, and then reactivated it with isopropanol. And I um, also tacked it with a little heat, like just with a little bit of a tacking iron under very low heat. Silk is very susceptible to heat, um, as I'm sure you know if you've ever tried to iron anything that is silk. And you can see here, now the ribbons are back and they're attached. Um, they're not serving a structural purpose anymore. They're just there for the aesthetics, really. Finally, the last stage in the process was to reassemble the book itself. I reinforced the sewing of the text block using linen thread and new sewing supports. I added space between the sections while sewing to accommodate the bulk of the hair so that the text block was no longer distorted. I frayed out two supports and pasted them onto the boards. And the fraying is really done to spread out their uh, when the leather is re-adhered. And to reattach the boards to the rest of the binding, I used a Japanese, toned Japanese paper and airplane cotton. And this is the process known as a reback. Overall, the treatment I devised to stabilize and remount the locks of hair in the album seemed to work very well. Stabilizing the hair onto the textile meant that individual hairs were less prone to breakage from mechanical wear, and remounting will prevent future hair lock loss. Stress sustained by pressure from the sewing thread on the hair was minimized by sewing loosely with relatively broad stitches and by the number of stitches. The remounting method ensures that the textile and not the hair will take the, uh, the stress of the attachment point. And then finally, although aesthetics should never be a reason for doing a conservation treatment, I was pleased that the stabilizing treatment did not negatively impact the way the hair locks looked. A modern day visitor to this Davenport House Museum will have a very similar visual reading experience to Sarah Davenport herself. 
And I'd just like to end by acknowledging a few people in the process. Thank you to Tim Gerzak, NEDCC collections photographer, for taking these beautiful photographs of the conservation process. And Anna Jean Hamill, NEDCC lead preparator, for helping me make a sewing frame from the hair. I'd also like to thank Graham Patton, a book conservator at the Boston Athenaeum, for his helpful advice, Bex Caswell Alton, Director of Book Conservation, and Terrence D'Ambrosio, Director of Imaging Services at NEDCC, for their support of this project. Jeff Freeman, Assistant Director and Collections Manager, and the other staff of the Davenport House Museum, for their enthusiastic permission in letting me present this conservation project. And finally, Camille myers breeze Director and Chief Conservator, and Morgan Bly Carbone, Associate Conservator, of Museum Textile Services for their helpful advice and for generously supplying me with textiles and thread. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was really wonderful. And um, of course, we now want to open it up to questions for everybody to ask. So hopefully you've been hanging on to them as Mary was going through her presentation. Um, just a reminder, of course, that we are recording today's session just from when I first came on earlier. Um, so if you would prefer your, your image not show up in our recording, you have a couple options. You can scroll down to the bottom of your screen and you can click that little chat button and we'll see whatever you type in the chat screen that pops up when you click that button. And that's one way you can ask some questions if, you, if you'd like to do it that way. The other is just to go down to sort of the, the bottom left of your screen if you're on a, a computer at least and stop the video. And that way you're it would just be your voice that's shared. Um, so completely up to you, but we'd now love to open it up to all of your questions. And a reminder, if you're gonna ask a question verbally, just make sure you unmute yourself as well. That's down next to the stop video button on your, on your Zoom. So who would like to start us off? <laughs> I would. Um, I, Mary, I'm Mary Ragno, and I have a question. Um, when you were doing your presentation, you mentioned that I think, as if I understood you, you mentioned that aesthetics should never be a reason for for um, uh, for choosing a treatment. Yes, and yeah. I, I guess I that that puzzles me because I well I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the book as an art form, mm -hmm. and a long ago artist who took great time mm -hmm. and pain to put this together. And I'm wondering why these, why would us, obviously there are lots of other reasons to save the hair in the book, but why would the aesthetics not be equally important to all of those others? So that's, that's a really good question. And perhaps I should have phrased it more as aesthetics should never be the primary reason. Um, and there's, this sort of opens up the whole conservation ethics can of worms. Um, because, you know, there are always competing factors in choosing to do a conservation treatment. Um, aesthetics is one of them, especially when it's a work of art um, in particular. And there's also, you know, the actual structure of the book, the materials, whether they can withstand a treatment. Um, so it's, it's probably more accurate to say that aesthetics should never be the primary motivation if it's going to harm the book in other ways. Um, so, you know, if choosing to do something like this had been harmful to the hair or the book, um, then, you know, the aesthetics of it wouldn't have really been as important. Um, you know, because ultimately, like, it, you know, it's sort of comparing ourselves to doctors, our first and primary motivation is to do no harm. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get into a whole sort of cascading series of priorities. Um, and aesthetics is certainly one of them. Um, so it is important, um, unless it's going to harm something in the book. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. So feel free to speak up if you have other questions. I'm going to go to one in our comment box. Um, and so this one's from Carmen. How much time did you spend on this project? That was actually the same question I was going to ask. Uh, you know, from start to finish, mm -hmm. how long did it take to do all this really detailed work? That's a good question. Um, it's, I would say, and I haven't 
you know, it's been a little while since I've done this project, but I think it was something in the order of, oh, 150 to 200 hours. Um, so a fair amount of time. And the actual, the book part of the book was very simple. Um, the rebinding and repairing the binding, that took very little time. The hair is actually what took the most time in the project. Um, and a fair amount of that time was just spent thinking, how on earth am I going to do this? <laughs> and, you know, consulting with other people and searching the literature. Um, so, you know, I can say it was 150 to 200 hours. In practice, it took several months, um, not all of that actively working on it. There are certain parts of the process where you stop and leave it for a while, stuff has to dry, it's getting sent off the imaging, they have to do their thing. Um, so, yeah. And, and I was going to ask um, if you could say a little bit about how you got interested in this, how it fits into sort of the rest of your life and all that you're doing. Yeah, um, well, so this was presented as a work project, uh, or do you mean um, how I get interested in the project or how I got interested in book conservation in general? Well, in, in this project in particular, but the, the, the wider question is also a good one. <laughs> okay, um, I'll start with the sort of more specific and then move outwards to the more general. Um, so in general at work, we don't get to choose which projects were assigned. Um, stuff shows up then it gets assigned based on who's free at the time or who has the most experience, um, who has an interest, that sort of thing. And this particular project came to me in part because I was sort of next in line for a project, but also because I have a significant amount of needlework and textile experience. Um, I grew up doing embroidery and sewing. Uh, and so of the people in the department, I seemed like a natural choice to work on this particular book. And, you know, I was really excited to do it. Like I said earlier, I think before it began, so some of you might not have heard, I grew up going to the Old Stone House Museum and attending the summer camp there, and they have some hair wreaths, and I was just really enthralled with those growing up. So I was excited to work with something like this. Um, in terms of how I got into book conservation, I actually got into it in college. I had a work study job on campus and my college has a book arts lab where they do book binding and letterpress printing and typesetting and paper making. And I just, I did that for my work study. During the summers, I worked in the conservation lab in the college library. And after I graduated, you know, it was one of those things where I would have happily have done that for free. And I was like, well, if I found something that I can make into a career, um, and I would happily spend my spare time doing that, you know, that's, that's perfect. You know, what more can I ask for than to have a job that I'm excited to go to each and every day. So that's how I got into it. That's great, cool. Um, and so uh, a question from Lucinda, uh, moving into our comments again, would you mm -hmm. give, can, well, can you give um, overall advice on um, preserving hair in albums or if, um, somebody were to have hair in their own keepsake bo boxes at home. Is there, you know, things that they should be doing or, or ways to help preserve the, the those kinds of items? Mm -hmm. um, so my best advice is mostly just storage and handling. In general, handle it as little as possible, especially, you know, the older it is, um, the more fragile the hair gets. So that becomes really important when the hair gets brittle. In terms of storage, um, you know, if you've got some acid-free archival tissue, that's a great way to store it, you know, just in a fold of tissue. Um, and then if you have some sort of acid-free or archival box, uh, just put it in there. Because the more you can keep it away from acid, which helps, you know, acid um, from certain paper products can deteriorate the hair, but also exposing it to light, um, can be really harmful to the hair. It causes it to discolor and also to become more brittle over time. Um, if you've got the hair, say, mounted, say it's a hair wreath or something, um, you know, make sure that the mounting materials are acid-free mat board and also, if possible, get UV protective glass um, for the frame. 
Yeah, and um, another question, we got a couple more questions here in the comments and one mm -hmm. from Carmen, have other conservators done similar work based on the sort of the research and the methods that you developed in this project? Uh, so this is a technique that I developed uh, myself and I just presented it to um, the American Institute for Conservation. Um, so it's just been made public and I will be publishing something on it later this year. Um, and so I expect at some point other people will be using this technique, um, you know, because this is, this is one particular item in one collection, but I'm sure there are many more across the country. Um, and, a, and another question here from Joan, um, she c mentions that they have a friendship album um, at a small, at their small museum in Glover, Vermont. Um, it's about mm -hmm. 12 pages of hair braids, locks um, for family and friends. Um, it's all in really good, sh good shape, she says. And um, she's wondering if, if you've ever experienced having someone show up and ask for a hair sample to do DNA, DNA testing. Has that ever, you know, that's something that these books ever end up getting used for? So that's, that would be pretty rare. Um, and it's for the reason that usually the hair, when it shows up in a hair album is cut um, and not pulled out of someone's head. And hair, from what I understand, um, unless you have the actual hair follicle and the root, you can't test the DNA. Um, you can get mitochondrial DNA from a lock of hair, but that only tells you sort of the matrilineal lineage of the hair. So it's not as useful for DNA testing. A, a cool question. I feel like I, I may have seen something like that in a mystery novel once or twice. <laughs> um, so just a, a reminder to everybody, we're, we have, uh, you know, it's about 2.45 now, but if there are other questions, this is a great time for you to unmute yourself and to speak up and ask Mary while we have her here with us. Um, and Mary, maybe I'll ask a question while we wait. And, you know, of course, everybody who's out in the meeting, um, if you're not wanting to, to share your voice, you can, of course, write them to us in our comment box. Um, but I'll ask one question, and I'm wondering where you see this work going now, you know, now that you've got like a method that sounds like really works and, and um, you know, this, this process, what, what more can be done going forward with this kind of work? Um, well, certainly I expect um, that I will see other objects like this in my career. Um, and I also expect that other people will start using the method. Um, so they will probably make revisions to the method, you know, refine it. If I get a chance to do it again, I'm sure there'll be things that I would do next time. Um, and, you know, that's something about conservation is it's kind of a constantly evolving field and we try and do the best that we have, like that we can with the knowledge and information that we have, but we are always trying to um, make sure that what we'll do is we'll stand the test of time. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody else has a question. I don't see any more in our chat, but I'll give people a second to, to speak if they want to. Oh, we actually have somebody joining right now while we're wrapping up, but <laughs> um, it was actually the person who emailed us for a recording of the session. So we'll make sure. So welcome, Carolyn. We're actually just wrapping up now, but if there are any last questions, now's a great time for people to speak up. Just remember you need to unmute yourself on the bottom left of your Zoom screen. It's usually on the bottom left, at least if you're on a computer. I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I, I was curious about, I understand why you would want to add a spacer in between the spine so that it's not, like I think you called them compensate, compensation stubs. Mm -hmm. And so when you fit the spine back on, it seems like you would have to add more leather to it to make it fit around. Am I missing something? Yeah, so what I did is, in this case, I didn't use leather. Um, I used a toned Japanese paper and um, an airplane cotton um, as the additional material to attach the boards. Because, you, you know, at some point, 
you will need more material to do that attachment, um, especially if the attachment of the leather is broken. Um, and so that's, that's what I did use. And I chose those materials instead of leather because um, leather can be, you know, a little bit, not difficult to work with, but over time it can start to degrade. And so, you know, this has felt that it would be less noticeable, especially since there's so little of the new material being shown. So oh, the spine ends up being a little bit wider yes, than originally. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Feel free to chime in if you have a question and you're waiting, your turn to ask. This is the perfect time. We're getting one more on our comments um, from Althea saying, it's off the point a little bit, but I've seen several hair wreaths um, and the Bennington Museum now has a crocheted hair bonnet on display. Oh, wow, that's uh, really cool. Yeah, and I guess Althea is curious, is, is that as common as hair wreaths, a hair bonnet? <laughs> I have to say, I've never heard of a hair bonnet, um, which doesn't mean that there aren't ones out there, but that's highly unusual, so that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Does, does anybody else have any questions? Maybe as we wrap up, we're, you know, just about 10 minutes before 3 p.m. So just want to invite you to speak up if you have anything else that you might want to ask. I'd just like to say thank you very much to Mary. This is, this is very interesting. Um, I, I've thought actually little about conservation of books and hair from a hundred plus years ago and things. And it's just all very interesting and a very enriching experience here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, um, I, I have to ask a question. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Um, I'm so I used to work at the old Stone House Museum and and love those hair wreaths. And I wonder, is there are there any directions on how to make them, or is anybody making hair jewelry today? Is there further information on? exactly how they did it. It's quite amazing. Yeah, so there, um, there are several websites dedicated to making hair jewelry and hair wreaths, um, and I think people do offer workshops in that as well. One book that I found is actually a reprint from the 1800s uh, right here, and this is an entire manual on how to do hair jewelry and make hair braids and so on. Um, it's called The Art of Hair Work by Mark Campbell. And it's just got a ton of diagrams um, and instructions on how to do that. So does, is that, um, do people stu still make a lot of hair wreaths, do you think, or hair braids? I think they make it mostly in the context of trying to learn the historical craft or sort of as a, I don't know, Victoriana um, type thing where, you know, they're working on Victorian style arts and crafts. Cool. So I want to give anybody else who's in the meeting that wants to ask a question, this is your chance. <laughs> I'll give you a few seconds to chime in. I know it takes a second to get over to that unmute button. All right, well, I'm not hearing anybody else, so maybe we'll wrap up there for today. But I just wanted to give everybody a warm thank you for joining us on our Sunday workshop series. We're really excited, of course, to have Mary French with us to talk about this really fascinating and unique topic. Um, so a warm thanks to Mary as well. And just a reminder that, um, you know, we do record all of these workshops. So if there's one you missed or a friend missed, you can find them on our website, which is just oldstonehousemuseum.org. Under the Learn tab, you'll see there's an archive page. Um, pretty soon, we actually have a whole week of workshops coming up for Old Stone House Week. So we hope to, to see all of you there. And a warm thank you again to Mary and to everybody for being here this afternoon. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Drew. Thanks. Thank you, Drew. Thank you.